I'm just going to take a springboard tonight from Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, the latter part of that verse tonight. Talk to you a little bit about the fire of God. Matthew 4, 11, or 3, 11, I'm sorry, Matthew 3, 11, it says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that is... He that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Father, help us tonight as only you can help us. Stir our hearts, dear Lord. We need the fire. We need that holy flame, Lord. We need it tonight, Jesus. We're calling upon you, Lord, because we need it, because we're desperate for it, Lord. Oh, the darkness and the deadness, Lord, will consume us if we don't get the fire. Lord, burning in our hearts and the glory manifested in our midst once again. Father, we need that touch from God. Lord, we ask for your help this evening, endeavoring to challenge us all. Lord, to contend for the glory. Contend for the fire, Lord of God, in our midst. And Lord, we'll praise you for all that you can do for us tonight. In Jesus' name. Fire has long been associated with the presence of God. All the way back in Genesis chapter 15, verse 17, when Abraham and God were making their covenant, and Abraham had offered his sacrifice on the altar, and he had did his vigil through the night to keep the buzzards and the ravens and the, the animals away from his sacrifice. And then the, there came a time when the Bible says the fire came down and consumed Abraham's sacrifice. The very presence of God is associated with fire many, many times. We know through the 40 years of the Exodus, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God had a pillar of cloud by day and what? A pillar of fire by night. The Shekinah presence of God would light up the sky, giving them protection, showing them light. God manifested himself on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, verse 18. God manifested himself on the top of the mount with fire and lightning. God is a God of fire. He's a God of fire. Not only we find that, but also the, the flame on the altar in the temple. You find that God answered Elijah by fire. The sacrifices and offerings were to be taken with fire. God has manifested himself down through time over and over and over. Even at the dedication of Solomon's temple, there was holy fire. On the day of Pentecost, there was holy fire. Cloven tongues of fire set on the head of each one of those 120 newly sanctified believers. And the fire ignited something within their heart. It ignited something within their soul. You know, fire produces energy. Fire produces energy. And we need that dynamic tonight, don't we? We need that dynamic in the church world. Now, it's, it's common sense and reason tells me that you and I are not going to jump and hoop and holler like people do when they're 20. It's just common sense tells us that most of us are not going to be able to do that. But I believe, friend, that the fire can be burning all the way down to the end of our journey and the enthusiasm and the excitement and the thrill of this thing can so possess us as to keep us in awe of his presence, keep us desirous of the glory. It's the glory that got a hold of my heart. Was it not the glory that touched your heart? Was it some dread, dead, dry sermon? Was it a reading of the manual that got a hold of your heart? Was it the standards? And I believe in the standards. You know I do. I'm in favor of them. I'm 100% behind keeping them. But that's not what draws people. It's the glory. It's the fire. 
He said he would baptize us with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now fire represents first and foremost in the believer's heart a cleansing. Fire purifies, does it not? How do they purify gold? They melt it until the impurities come to the top and they skim them off. Silver the same way. They melt it down until the impurities separate. And friend, God wants to melt us down until the impurities separate. And with that fiery, sanctifying presence of the Holy Ghost, He wants to cleanse our hearts and purify our souls. Amen? Fire, fire. This is our plea tonight. We need fire. We need Holy Ghost fire. If we're going to have holiness, we're going to have to have fire. Without the sanctifying fire of the Spirit, friend, there is no holiness. You can keep every rule in the book and not be holy. I said, how's that possible? Friend, because the heart is set on doing its own way and having its own way. It must be purified by the sanctifying flames of the Spirit of God. And we're not going to get there any other way. But if the Spirit of God and the fire has gone out, or if this fire is, is waning very low, we need to fan the flames, don't we? So that God can do His work. He wants to do it. This is His plan. I believe we have the doctrine. If I didn't, I'd be preaching in another church tonight. If I didn't believe in entire sanctification as a second definite work of grace, I'd be preaching in a Baptist church somewhere tonight probably. But I want to tell you something tonight. I believe it. I experienced it. And it was the fire in that service that night in November of 78 that touched my heart. I couldn't tell you what Brother Junior Malloy preached that night. I couldn't tell you a word he preached. But it was God in the midst and it was the special song that really touched my heart and started the tears to flow and started the conviction to come. It was God anointing the ministry of his people. Friend, we must have fire. We must have the fire. It's not only the fire in, in the purifying effect, but the fire in the illuminating effect. Friend, fire gives off light. Light is essential to vision. And that's true in the natural as well as the spiritual world. We must have his divine light. We must see it as God sees it. We must look at it from God's perspective. And the spirit is all that can shed the light on this blessed book that we need. Why are there so many doctrines? Why are there so many churches? Why are there so many thoughts on this and that and the other? Friend, if we look at it in the human, we're going to get a human interpretation. But this book is divinely breathed, divinely inspired. And the Spirit of God is the one that inspired it. And it takes the Spirit of God to understand it. And to apply it to our hearts. We need the fire. We need the illuminating fire. We have LED lights. We have flashlights. We have battery lights. We have all kinds of lights in the world today. Back in Jesus' day, it was a torch piece of wood with maybe some pine tar on it. And that's how they went to get Jesus. But they needed something to give them light. We need something to give us light in this day. We are so educated we can figure it out. We are so enlightened that we know more than God knows. We are so privileged and so educated that we don't need the anointing and inspiration of the Spirit to understand spiritual things. Nonsense. That's where a lot of the church world is at today. In fact, I had a former pastor tell me he didn't need any more light. He had all the light he needed in his life. And at the same time, he was having an affair with the church secretary. And I guess that's the reason he didn't need any more light. But I want to tell you, every genuine Christian needs the light. We want the light. We desire to walk in the light. He said, well, oh, God's already given us enough light. If we just walk in the light we've got, we better be walking in the light we have or we're walking in darkness tonight. Did you know that? That's what the Word of God says. If we don't walk in the light, then we're going to be walking in darkness. And friend, when you walk in darkness, you know not whither you go. But I'm so glad tonight that the Holy Ghost that gives us light can help us walk in that light and then also give us new light. As we travel this journey, I don't think you get too old to get light, do you? I don't think so. I believe what God wants to give us light 
and fire gives light. The Holy Ghost fire in your soul will give you light. It will give you energy. It will give you purity. It will give you warmth. We're in a cold, cold day. And I want to tell you, if there's ever a time the church needs to be on fire, it's right now. Because the world is turning against Christ just as rapidly as it possibly can. I think it's turning against our God, our gospel, our, our purpose, our standards, our morality. It's all being put down the sewer. They don't care a thing about it. Friend, America is turning against Christ far, far greater than we're getting people into the church for Christ. Why do you think that is? I fear we're, we're lacking in the area of fire, warmth, light, energy, dynamic. Oh, that God would come and manifest his glory. That Shekinah presence would break us up a little bit. You want to be broke up? We're not supposed to be wearing mascara, so we shouldn't be worried about our mascara running. Right? So what would it hurt to get broken up a little bit? What would it hurt sometime to say a spontaneous amen? Or a spontaneous glory to God? Or a spontaneous hallelujah? Friend, the fire, where's the fire gone? Where has the fire gone in our movement? We were known for this. The Nazarenes in their glory days. Noisyrenes, they were called. Shouting. <laughs> praising God. Spontaneous testimonies. Spontaneous outbursts of song. Oh God, we need the fire. We need the fire, folks. need the fire. It's going to take the fire to bring revival. The fire represents his glory, his majesty, his presence. Fire was the emblem of Yahweh in his glory in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. If you read that, it talks about his throne was, was uh, like a blaze. It was a fire. It was a glory. It was burning. Then in Isaiah, we talk here about the tongues from off the altar, bringing the fire from off the altar to touch the prophet's lips. And it did something for him, did it not? He said, your iniquities are cleansed and purged. And Isaiah began to hear, and Isaiah began to respond, here I am, Lord, send me. That's what the fire does. The fire will take away our sin. We see ourselves when we see the fire. We get a true estimation of where we are spiritually and God's able to help us then when we do, when we really acknowledge where we are, God can help us. And then he touches us with that fire. And then we're a new man. We're wanting the things of God. We're eager for the things of God. Church is not a drudgery. Never. Never. Revivals, camp meetings, prayer meetings, street meetings. My, now you're getting radical, preacher. We used to do all that. Cottage prayer meetings. When the fire's burning, the church is moving. When the fire is burning, the church is going forward. Friends, I, I beg of you tonight, and I am putting myself in line for this a touch of God's fire. I want him to give me a fresh touch of fire. I want him to set me ablaze. If I'm the only one that says amen, let me say it anyway. If I'm the only one that shouts hallelujah, let me shout it anyway. If I'm the only one that takes a walk around the church for Jesus, let me take it anyway. I want the fire burning in my heart. I don't want the deadness to kill me, do you? 
I don't want the deadness to kill me. You know, we could stay in the freezer long enough to pretty soon we'd be frozen, wouldn't we? God, help us to thaw the freezer. <laughs> God, make us so hot that we'll thaw out those around us that might be a little cold. Lord, help us tonight. He said, this is nonsensical preaching. Well, you can mark it up for whatever you want. But I tell you what, if we don't see fire, if we don't see the divine manifestation of the presence of God in our hearts and in our lives and in our church, we are a dying church. We need the fire. I must have the fire. I was born under the fire. I got in under Holy Ghost conviction. I got in under the blessings of God. I got in under that time where the Spirit of God was in such a way and such a measure present that everybody knew God was there when he showed up. The sinners would acknowledge it. School principal came to our church from the area there where we were pastoring. He said, every time I enter these doors, he said, I feel the presence of God. There is no greater compliment to a church than that. If people come through our doors and we've prayed and we're on fire ourselves and we bring that fire to church, friend, when the fire is here, they're going to sense God. They're going to sense his presence because he's too big to hide when he's really here and his glory is too big to hide. God wants to do something for us. We can't get used to the darkness. We can't get used to the coldness. We need the light. We need the power. We need the energy. We need that divine dynamics of the Spirit working in our midst so that we're energized, so that we're empowered. And that's what he said he would do when he filled us with the Holy Ghost. He said, I'll give you power. Dynamite. <coughs> Dunamis is the Greek word. Our word for dynamite. I want the fire. I want the fire. I'm contending for the fire. I'm contending that God would touch my lips afresh and anew. Holy Ghost fire. God would touch our church afresh and anew. Holy Ghost fire. You know, it's kind of amazing to me that the same emblem that's used for the purifying of the church, the empowering of the church, the illuminating of the church, the warming of the church is also used for the judgment of God. Our God is a consuming fire. Hail is an everlasting fire. Lord, how, how, how do you use the same emblem and produce such different consequences? And I think the answer lies in what we're doing, what our response is to him. It's going to all lie in what we do with him. How we want him or how we don't want him. How we're contending for him or we're doesn't matter if he comes or not. We can go through our normal routine. We can have church. Are you content to have church? Are you content just to gather three times a week? We're way too predictable, folks. We're way too predictable. We need the fire to break up the monotony. We need the fire to break up the routine, the mundane, the ritual. I've told you before, I don't like ruts. I don't like ruts. I don't like to drive in the same path every time. And when it comes to church, I certainly don't like ruts. I want God to move. I want the fire to burn. I want this younger generation to see that God is real. We talk about Him. 
We tell them about him. But wonder what kind of impress it would make if he showed up in power. Friend, I've been in services where you couldn't do anything but weep. Whole congregations were weeping. Just weeping. Just weeping. God, the Holy Spirit came in a mood that way. It wasn't loud. It wasn't boisterous. It wasn't shouting or running the aisles that day. It was just a weeping, crying, sobbing, concern for souls. Friend, we need to be broken up. God's too big to come the same way every time. But he ought to come every time, whatever mood he wants to take that particular time. I want his presence, don't you? I want his presence. I'm contending for the fire. I'm asking him, fan the flames. You know, the, the fire in the, the seven candlestick menorah in the temple, the fire was never to go out. That candlestick was never to go out. That fire was to burn continually. And I think during certain periods of time of the Jewish people, I think the altar fires were never to go out. Friend, I believe that God wants us to keep the fire burning. I believe that Jesus wants us to keep the fire burning. He tells us to be fervent in spirit. He tells us to be fervent in our love one for another. He tells us that the fervent effectual prayer of a righteous person availeth much. Does he want us to be hot? Does he want us to be on fire? Fervent means hot. In fact, it means boiling hot. I want the fire, don't you? Shall we stand?